Hi, this is Gordon Wolvet, and you're listening to the FSF Popcast. The show that made the Magog seem less revolting. Now that's saying something. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number 110. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins the crew of the Enterprise in their struggle against the Magog, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of his Roddenberry family crest. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, our guest today is an actor who's had many roles over the years in shows like Bride of Chucky, Supernatural, and of course, his role as Seamus Harper in Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda, to name a few. We are so happy, and actually, I'm pretty excited about this, to have a chance to sit down with Gordon Wolvet and have him here on the FSF Podcast. So welcome to the show, Gordon. Yay. Hello. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. We'll see if that excitement holds. We've got a few questions and a bunch of mistakes for me coming up. So I feel that the majority <laughs> of the time it has held. Majority of the time. We've had a couple. Those are purely on this side of the table, though. So I'll, I mean, try, to, I'll try to make some mistakes, too. Excellent. I won't feel as bad. I, I, we Excellent. have yet to have a guest storm out, though. So Really? We obviously I need to try, aren't need to try harder. Super terribly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we have, we have, we have First made everything. it. We have made it in this world. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's my improv training. You accept everything. I love it. <laughs> All right, Gordon. So one of the things that we have loved to do on our show, and one of the things that kind of become a staple here on the FSF podcast is we like to find out the story of the actors that we're talking about, because uh, we're nerds and we love origin stories origin stories are are amazing and so we want to know the origin story of gordon what were the influences and the factors in the life of wee little lad gordon wee that little helped, lad. yes that helped him and get started in the entertainment industry i was a wee little lad by the way and in grade in grade seven and grade eight and my junior i guess junior high i guess that's called or middle school whatever you call that um I was always Cupid at the Valentine's dance. I was literally the smallest person in our entire school, so they dressed me up as Cupid for the dance. So yeah, I was always very wee and little. But uh, um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but uh, so I guess I and I got beat up a few times too because it was an actor in a, as an actor in a tough town, Hamilton, Ontario, which is uh, you know it's not you, you you're the flaky artist actor amongst a bunch of you know a, a town of steel town families it's not a it's yeah. it's you're kind of standing out a little bit so i'm uh, not really beat up just got you know i suffered a bit of a bit more attention than i wanted but um so yeah i trained as an actor as a kid because i just wanted to i was like hey mom dad i want to act i want to act so i went to theater school for like eight eight years and trained. and then i did my first movie in 1989 i had uh actually before that sorry i i did a play called oliver on stage and I played Oliver Okay, and it, it was being produced by the school that I'd gone through. They had a theater company. And so I auditioned, I got the part the title role. Uh, there was an agent in the audience. The agent came up to me after one of the, one of the performances. It was like a 12, 12 performance run, I think. And they, uh, they came up to me afterwards and said, Hey, do you want to start auditioning for television and film? And I said, yes. And so I started auditioning and then I got my first movie with James Woods and Alan Arkin. May he rest. Oh, wow. In yeah. Yeah, my first film was with James Woods and Alan Arkin. I played James Woods' son. Alan Arkin was the grandpa. It's called jo uh, Joshua Then and Now, based on a Mordecai Richler book. And so I had a, I had a couple of weeks on that. And I remember uh, watching James Woods and Alan Arkin working. The script would end, and the camera would keep rolling, and they'd keep saying all this stuff. And I'd be looking going, oh, so you don't have to stick to the script. Oh, so I can just make crap up. Okay, great. This is great. And so from like literally my first movie, I was kind of stricken with the curse of improv because of those two. Uh, a, a little side note, Alan Arkin also gave me my very first acting class, my not acting class, but my you know best tip from a professional actor. Uh, we were doing a scene and I'm his grandson and when the other two kids are sitting beside me where the grandkids listening to grandpa tell us a story and he's telling us the story and we're sitting here listening and as he's telling the story he just stops and rolls right into looking at me and saying you know kid just listen 
just listen to the story. Because I guess I was like acting like I was listening to this story and I was being really big and interested and wow and wow, listen to this story. And he was like, kid, just listen. And I, I think I was throwing Alan Arkin off. And so then I was like, oh, okay, right, I'll just listen. And it was a really, really, really important tip because you'd be surprised how many actors don't just listen to the other actor speaking, you know? You're getting ready to say your big line or, or whatever. You're not just mm -hmm. listening to the person and responding. And then... Um, and then I just kept auditioning in Toronto, Ontario, doing a bunch of really bad Canadian uh, TV shows and films. And uh, I actually did, you know, there's a lot of series. I did five different television series. I did a Miss Jules Verne's Mysterious Island, where I lived in New Zealand mm -hmm. for a year. Went on safari in South Africa for a few months, hosting a wildlife show. Got chased up a tree by a zebra. I was bitten by a cheetah. Um, and then did a few more shows, a few more films, and then uh, moved, got, uh, I did a, a Canadian film called Peacekeepers. And from that, a casting director in LA um, negotiated a deal with me where they, were, where they were like, you know, we really like your work. A CBS would like to put you on a holding deal. So, which is where you cannot audition for anything. Uh, but you know, CB, uh, CBS projects will come along and they'll try to plug you into one of them. So they paid me, a, you know, a lot of money to come out to LA and we were moving out to LA anyway. So we did moved out to LA was on a holding deal for a year in retrospect, I, any actor ever being offered a holding deal. I don't know that I would recommend it because it didn't work out for me. There were three projects that they were thinking, you know, they were thinking of plugging me into and mm -hmm. it, it just didn't work out. But that's not why I wouldn't recommend it because I mean, I made, you know, really great money doing it, but I, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't audition for anything. CBS owned me for a year. And I learned later that sometimes they do this, not just because they're thinking of putting you in something, but just on the off chance, another network wants you for something. Mm. And just oh, so they're, yeah. you know, they're thinking maybe, but you know, it's just, it's just, just controlling the market. And so, and so right about the time that ended was when I auditioned for Andromeda and okay. uh, I, I was in LA, it was shooting in Canada. They, they came out and uh, I did one audition and I came home and I walked into the apartment and I said to my wife, damn it, I got it. I know I got it. She was like, what? Well, why are you upset? I'm like, we're gonna have to move back to Canada. <laughs> we, like, we just moved to LA, we got all settled. We've been here for like a year and now, and, and so sure enough, yeah, we got it and, and, and moved back to Canada to shoot it. And then after that, moved back to LA and you know, and then somewhere along the way there, I did Chucky and a few other movies and yeah. And then Andromeda ended and, and uh, you know, I've been kicking around doing episodics and stuff here and there, but, uh, and, and then now I'm teaching. Excellent. That's my story. I love it. So I have one follow-up question for you about that whole, the whole story. And it's based off a TikTok I saw today from one of my favorite creators. Uh, he goes, he talks about all the animals that, you know, uh, you know, are like worse than you think they are. Uh, and, and all these things, I can't remember his name and I'm, I'm horrible at remembering who they are to have to go back and search through it. So anyway, there's all that information that nobody needed. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I needed it. Thank you. I was wondering, you answered every question that came into my mind. Oh, you're a wonderful <laughs> liar. I love it. Okay. So uh, in the TikTok, though, he talks about how zebras are far meaner than anybody gives them credit for and how they, they have actually uh, either injured or killed a ton of people every year. Not a ton of people, but but you know enough people every year that that, that they you know well you know damage. i mean this is the mistake that my people make about all wild animals wildlife is wildlife right so they're yeah they're we, they may look cute and just because they're not a predator that doesn't mean they are um uh you know cute and cuddly and in fact my yeah my zebra story was we were this is a really cool story i hope you I hope you don't mind me telling it it'll no, take No please do yeah Okay, so uh, we were on safari, and um, the the producer. There was a small crew, like a like a like we had a crew of thirteen, right? We had th we had three hosts, three hosts. Each of us had one camera each. We had a producer and a director, and then a, a sound person, and um, like maybe one or two other. Uh, uh, PAs or, you know, helpers, whatever you want to call them. And so a little convoy of, you know, 13 cars trucking through the safari for a few months. So she says, okay, tomorrow morning, all we know is we have to get up at 7 a.m. and we have to be at these coordinates. I've got some GPS coordinates and this is like in the 90s. So, okay. you know, you can't just, you can't just do this with your iPhone. There were no iPhones yet. And so right. we, sh we show up. 
we're in the middle of the savannah, like it's at the end of this long, 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 you know, secluded road, they, you know, and the savannah is like, you know, um, uh, trees and scrub, but they're, they don't grow, you know, it's very sparse. So you can see for a long, you can see for miles and miles. And we're standing there, we're waiting, and all of a sudden we see a helicopter coming in the distance, like the, 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 just kind of flying erratically we're like what the heck and it's moving and flying you know doing this really weird pattern and then this transport truck comes skidding down the road like this huge long truck the back opens up and 30 guys jump out and they've got these steel cables and like half of them run one way on a 45 degree angle away from the truck and the other half of them run the other way a 45 degree angle from the back of the truck interesting and this is a yeah, and this is all happening, and nobody talks to us. And our producer's like, okay, roll the cameras, roll the cameras. We'll get one with you, one with you, and just like, just go with it. Whatever happens, happens. We're like, okay, and so they go out, and we see they're stringing these cables up in a 45-degree angle from the top of the truck onto the trees and off into the into the savannah. And then more guys kind of jump out, and they get all these canvases, and they start stringing the canvases on them, and they're, they're, they're dragging them all the way out. And I slowly start to realize they're creating a giant funnel across the savannah like huge you know at the opening it would have been a, probably a mile across and um and they're dragging these things out and then there's they're stringing more cables across from uh, from the one angled cable to the other in sections so they're creating sections that they're going to later use as they move all the creatures forward they close it off with the curtain keep moving them okay. forward and eventually funnel, funnel an entire herd of zebra, like hundreds of zebra, into this truck, into this huge, huge truck. Maybe not hundreds, probably like around 100, I think. It's probably as many okay. as you could fit in that. And that's when we realized, okay, that's what the helicopter's doing. The helicopter's been out there rounding up this whole time and, and, and herding the zebra. And so sure enough, um, they, uh, they tell us we've got to step aside, we've got to get out of the way. So we step aside, we get out of the way, and we see the helicopter starts funneling in these zebra into these curtains. And as it's moving them forward, they're closing, sorry, between the funnel, they're closing off the curtains behind them. And so they start to, you know, they, they finally get them in far enough that the helicopter can go away and they start manually moving them forward section by section and closing off the curtains. So for safety, they have me and a camera person one section behind. So as they close the curtain, I move forward into the next empty, empty section and they start moving them forward, uh, start, you know, getting them to go up a ramp into the truck. And one of them breaks free. And it jumps over the curtain like it kind of I don't I don't know how it could have like jumped right over the cable in my memory. That's what I see. But it must have like jumped through like a seam in this in the tarps or wooden okay, canvases yeah. or whatever. But anyway, it breaks free and it's coming straight for us, me and our camera guy. And it comes right at us. And I just scramble right up this tree that we we're standing beside the camera guy, like awesome camera guy doesn't stop. He just, you know, he just follows me up the tree and he just stands there like he's, he knows it's coming, but he's going to get the shot. And this thing, it literally chased me up the tree. It reared up and it started like batting at the tree with its front hooves. And I'm like, I'm going to get killed by a zebra here. And dude is still just taking the shot. Um, somebody comes around, they chase it and they chase it right back in again. They close it and then they get them all on. And the, again, the whole time, nobody speaks to each other. And if you do, they still like, even though there's truck noises and helicopter noises there's no talking because er, you know they try to keep everything uh, at a minimum so there's like minimal impact on the animal's psyche right they don't right. They don't want they don't want to freak him out any more than they already freaked out then we all climbed on top of the truck and and took turns um sedating them a big long stick with a hypodermic on the end of it and sedating the zebra so that they uh would be um better for the ride you know emotionally more stable for the for the the long relocation and this is all to relocate them because of poachers when you have oh, high yeah when you okay. have you have a, you know huge vast populations of zebra in one area it's easy for them to go in and just pick them off and so yeah so that's how i got chased up a tree by a zebra it's both really cool and kind of sad all at the same time because of the, the poacher aspect but it is yeah. it, it it is sad but it's you know it's funny the poach the whole poaching thing is like very controversial because a lot of people will say you know it's, it's our livelihood and it's you know in some some cultures there's tradition attached to it and so you know it is a contentious issue but but ultimately it's against the law and you know their the numbers are i think their numbers are dwindling but it's really cool and it, like by by it was by 11 a.m or or maybe 11 30 it was done they had they had the ropes all back up the truck was done the 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 oh the truck got stuck we had to push it 
all of us, like the entire crew rocking a transport truck full of zebra back and forth to try and get the rear wheel out of, and they were singing, and it was pretty cool. Got it out of the, got it out of the puddle, and, and off it went. And the, the last thing was the helicopter circled back and gave us one more flyby and a salute just for the camera, you know, the maverick showing off, and off he went. Nice. Good luck editing that. I didn't breathe once. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. I'm like trying to come up with like a good segue into my question. And oh, there's I, not. That's I'll, good. I'll that's... give you one. I'll give you one. What's your question? There we go. <laughs> I was just thinking that's going to be a great bonus, a bonus section right there. Yeah, the whole that thing. That is a great bonus. We'll I'll put give that on you a segue. Our... You say, speaking of stripes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I know that we're going to get into some of your roles in, a, in the next couple of questions. But leading into that, I actually wanted to talk about your teaching work first, which oh, okay. you have on the screen there with OutSchool. That's right. Your yeah. website says that the techniques you teach form a path to making stronger choices based on your own instruction and experience. So what do you mean by stronger choices? And could you maybe give us an example to help us understand that concept? Flex. To flex your muscles and look bigger and stronger. No, no. Uh, <laughs> you know when you're making when you're making subtextual choices. You know, you the writer will write. Uh, Robert Wolf will kill me here. No, the right. You know, the the writers write a lot, right? And but there's always stuff left out. There are always unanswered questions, and you have to answer those. For instance, um, you're a waiter in a cafe. You have one line in the script. You know, all the writers wrote you was one line because you don't matter to the story in the script. All that matters is you have to deliver a coffee. You have, you have to walk in and say, hi, can I get you a coffee? Or, or, or hi, do you want another coffee? And then, and then leave again. Mm -hmm. But as far as the audience is concerned, they are watching a real world. They want that waiter to be a real waiter. So you, that, the person playing that waiter with that one single line needs to try and make a stronger choice about what's going on in their life. It doesn't mean you have to overact, but it means that when you get into the audition room, the, act, the, the directors and the writers, they can see, oh wow, you brought something to it. For instance, what does this waiter want? Does this waiter want to get home earlier today? Hi, can I get you a coffee? Or does this waiter want a really great tip? Hi, can I get you a coffee? Right? Or uh, did this waiter tell this person, I told you not to come to this restaurant, don't visit me again. Hi, can I get you a coffee? <laughs> Right? Like, what do you want? Right. Your, your, okay. job is the, your job as the actor, of course, is to um, not come up with some, okay, my strong choice is my dog is dying. And, uh, and we're, hi, can I get you a coffee? Right? You obviously have to be smart about this. But you want to make a strong choice that brings something. Not just, will I want to give them a coffee? Because nobody wants to just deliver a coffee at their coffee job. You're thinking about stranger things or you're wondering what time is lunch or, mm -hmm. and so just some kind of stronger choice when you're filling in the blanks, brings something to the piece that makes you real, makes the story a little bit more real and adds to the, you know, adds to either the tension that it ne if it needs it or just something. It, and then when you do that, when you make that choice, it doesn't mean it's the right choice or the wrong choice, but it's something and it's real and it's entertaining. And that may not be what the director wanted or, or, but if, it, if it's an audition situation, they see, oh, wow, you are not just, you know, thinking about the line. You're not just an empty actor. You've got, you're bringing more to it. You're making a choice. Okay. And so then they'll give you the choice. You know, can you play it like this? We'd like you to do this or whatever. And then when you have the part, of course, it's your job then because you own that character, you know, like with Harper. You know, you're always filtering, you, you know the character, so now you're making stronger choices and filtering everything through, how do I know this character? What drives this character? What does he want? Mm -hmm. You know, we all know what Harper wanted. So. <laughs> right. Right. Hmm. You know, everything, like he's, everything he says to Rami is, is kind of like, you know, he really wishes. <laughs> you know, I, a lot of people don't realize this. You know, there's a lot of these jokes about, you know, Harper, you know, having, you know, wanting Rami because Rami's sexy. But in my mind, you know, Harper was in love with Rami. He was okay. also in love with Trance. Harper was in love with a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Well, hey, since we're talking about Harper, my next question was actually about Seamus oh, Harper. Oh, look at so, you getting the... Look, yeah, look at that segue. You get the segue. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Got to lead in. You, 
But before you do that segue, I would like to thank you for mentioning my classes on outschool.com. For Absolutely. <laughs> and, my, and my adult classes that I'm going to be starting up on gordonwolvet.com. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so you guys go to those websites. You'll be able to find out more about those there uh, and get some acting classes from an excellent actor. And now, a word from our show sponsor, Level Up Savers. Their link can be found in the show notes. So now let's talk about one of those roles that you did for some excellent acting on. And, and so for me, the, the thing that I knew you best for, and the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was because of your work as, as Seamus on, on Andromeda. Uh, and to me, Seamus was always kind of the humorous, right? He was always kind of, in my opinion, uh, a bit of the comic relief. He'd come in, he'd say something cheeky, have this great one-liner, and he'd kind of walk out of the room, just kind of like, leaving everybody else there going like, what the hell just happened? And I loved that about him. There was a sarcasticness to him that that really speaks to me because I am by nature a sarcastic person. So I love that style of humor. So my question for you is, is did you find that role easy for you to be able to execute? Or was it something that is, was inside was it inside your, your wheelhouse? Or was it something that's outside of your natural personality where you had to learn how to become that type of person? You know, with every role, going back to that conversation about making strong choices, sure. you must always make those strong choices from you. You must always try to make authentic, strong choices and bring part of yourself. So yeah, part of that was really easy for me. Part of that was, yeah, that's a side of me. I can be very, I can be very sarcastic and not serious and, and you know, deal with conflict by using humor and, you know, and trying to, you know, and having that kind of, and underneath there's really a lot of pain and a lot of all that. I can absolutely be that sort of, but that's not just who I am. That's sort of one part, one sort of aspect of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was difficult. It was so that, so, so bringing that to it was, was fairly, yeah, it was fairly quickly accessible to bring to the audition. I also improvised, okay. I also improvised a little bit in the audition because again you know improv is another thing i teach and it's you know it's a big staple i perform improv now i, I perform weekly and I, I still train in improv too i still you're never too old to keep learning and um so i improvise and when they walked me on set the first day uh alan eastman the executive producer he walked me onto the set with his arm around me and said just i want everyone to know we're gonna let gordon improvise Yes, he's going to stick to the script, but he's also going to improvise. Going back to that James Woods and Alan Arthur mm -hmm. thing. And I was just like, yes, this is so awesome. <laughs> I get to play this like fun character and I get to improvise a little bit. And uh, it's a fun character to do. But the other, other side of the answer is, yeah, it was hard to sustain. Because you want your oh, character, yeah, yeah. you know, you want, you want your character to have a journey to change a little bit. You know, and over the course of it, I it was tough because there we had the change in head writers and we, you know, we got stuck on Sifra and I hated Sifra. I hated being on Sifra. I wanted to be back on the ship explore, you know, dealing with the space and things. But and so that that area, that time when uh, Harper became a bartender on Sifra, I had a real tough struggle with that, with that character, because, uh, you know, the scrappy, sarcastic um, ship's engineer who means well, but is a real genius when it comes to the ship and is a really good engineer, loses some of that redeeming quality when now he's a bartender. Yeah. Right? He's, not, he's not the ship's engineer. He doesn't get to do all those really great, cool, genius things. And so now it's kind of like, okay, now he's just a smart aleck bartender. And so, um, cause fans would come up to me and they would see either say what you say. I love your character. He's sarcastic. He's so much like me. Or they'd be like, yeah, I don't like your character. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, they, they, there's no middle ground. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I think about, yeah. I, I can see that. I can yeah. see that. Sarcastic <laughs> and hiding the pain with the sarcasm. I felt seen. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
<laughs> yeah, I love that. And okay. I, and I can I can identify a lot with that because I think that I think as a sarcastic person, you know, even myself, you know, and I, I'm not an actor, obviously. Uh but I, I think that even just in everyday relationships and conversations, you know, I and in my life's journey, I've tried to make changes and I've tried to make advancements in who I am and what I am and and everything. But there's still that that whole selection of people that are like, yeah, I don't like your character. And, and that's because, you know, that's just who I am. That's just the sarcasm that that's kind of built in. And I, you know, yeah, so I, it can, I do. You I can't do get please that. everyone. You can't no, please no, no, everyone. No. no, not at all. Yeah. But yeah, I. I from the the first uh, the first couple episodes of of watching and then when you come on screen i was like because i i recently i started watching it again back on Am uh, it's on amazon prime right now and so i've been watching it again on amazon and and i'm about halfway through the first season right now and uh i had forgotten that that there was the whole thing with like the data port in your neck and you shove that thing in there i was like oh man what the oh yeah that's how he does yeah. that <laughs> yeah and that was cool yeah like again that right i didn't get to do much of that on seafred all that all these great little harper things kind of kind of were like oh i couldn't do them much anymore but uh uh but yeah um it, it was a lot of fun it was it was a fun character to play for sure went from jamming a data port into your neck to can hi can i get you a coffee yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> That's, hi can i get you a coffee yes i'd rather be on a spaceship right now with Andro <laughs> yeah, exactly um, everybody rather be on a spaceship yeah, exactly. You know that. But that's I have a lot of swag. The thing I don't have anymore is my uh, my data port. I did have it for a while, but the data port for all of you uh, Harper, any if there's any Harper fans left at home that want to make your own data port, all you need is a Phillips shaver. It was uh, the, it was the you know those little round heads on an electric shaver. Oh, yeah, that's what it was. It was one of those. <laughs> oh no, kidding. Yeah, it was one of those glued in. They made it like a little plastic housing around it, but the plastic housing was really basic. Like it was just like a little little circle with a couple of um, uh, out sections that jutted out, outcroppings, I guess you would mm -hmm. call them. I don't know. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and a Phillips shaver head glued into the middle of it. So for any, if, anybody, if anybody wants to cosplay a data part, get yourself a Phillips shaver head. Taking, I cool. sell those on my website. No, I don't. <laughs> Taking notes from the Star Wars prop department. Oh yeah, because they used the, the Gillette for the the little communicator. Yeah, and there's a there's a dog toy in a scene in Star Wars, and the ice cream maker, and oh yeah, the Cantana, yeah. yeah, and a light switch on the wall, and yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you've seen yeah. that one. Oh yeah, gotta love it. So I actually get to use the segue this time. Talking about play characters, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> I actually found what I unfortunately should say it was a rather old interview um 2001 ish interview with you so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna talk about how old that is because that's just depressing thank you my thank um you. where you compared acting to playing a character in D D or another role-playing game so <laughs> what got you into rpgs do you still play and do you think that that sort of collaborative improv storytelling helps people get into acting well right now I have also an out school. I have a class um, called Explore the Multiverse, where I have my learners invent 10 worlds that they can make up, and then we use a 10-sided die to visit those Ooh. worlds. They have to come up with some kind of interdimensional travel, and by the end of the week, they have to try and uh, visit every world that they've come up with. So I guess, yeah, I'm just, a, I'm a D&D &D nerd. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. I, yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm also a sci-fi, you know, I'm a sci-fi nerd. Before Andromeda, uh, you know, I was a I was a huge uh, STNG fan, and my claim before okay. Andromeda was that was that um, I could within the first ten seconds of any STNG episode, I could tell you what episode it is by I could tell you what the title is, but I could tell you any single episode within the within the first wow. ten seconds. Yeah, um, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I can barely remember I can barely remember my kids' names, but uh -huh. but uh, yeah. I, but I played a lot of D. I played a lot of D and D. Yeah, I was the kind of D and D player. Where, and it's funny. I was also in a rock band. I did you. You know, you saw uh, Stranger Things this last season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the long haired D and D. Yeah, Eddie. Eddie. I was Eddie. Oh. I was literally Eddie. They lived. Oh, that's cool. I, yeah, yeah. I, I had the same jack jean jacket with a band patch on the back, and I was in a band. Oh, and good. then, and we would play D and D for three, four days at a time. We'd go down into the basement. We'd get like boxes of fig newtons and cookies and chips. You know, we'd play until we passed out, and then we'd wake up and just play some more. My mom would yell down, "What are you doing?" And we'd say, oh, "We're fine. We're fine." And we'd be there for days. Yeah. 
I love it. So there's definitely something between role playing and acting. And obviously now too, from what I see the videos now, people online, people are getting much more into the the, uh, the role playing part of D&D, you know, for mm -hmm. us, it was more, you know, being nerds sitting around a table and we had right. a really, gr we had a really great DM. So, you know, he, he, he was amazing. I think, I think I got up to like a 40th level um, magic user. And this is um, AD and AD and D <laughs> advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I forget what, what, what level it's at now. I haven't played in a while. But anyway. anyway. Uh, All right. Well, so cool. my, my husband was also when we watched the most recent season of Stranger Things and Eddie showed up and he's like, oh, my gosh, it's me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm it sure is. A lot, I'm sure a lot of people said that they they did a great job of, of recreating nostalgia for that time mm -hmm. period. Yeah. And yeah. we actually just last week. We did what we call roll for date and. It is so much fun. It was a, a an idea I had seen online, and I'm like, you know what? We're gonna try this. We need to do something. We can't agree on what we're doing. Let's just roll for date. So you get the list of what your restaurants are, and whatever number you go is the restaurant you go to, and then you like break up the menu in sections and roll for what you're gonna eat and what you get it to drink. It was actually a lot of fun. It was it was. In Interesting and you should, experience. And you should add, if you get a natural critical hit with that roll, you have to spend like at least 300 bucks or something. <laughs> or some some kind of some kind of critical hit adjustment. <laughs> there should be something. That's right. We need to right. we need to expand it. It was a it was a trial run on whether or not it would work. And we both That's ended cool. up with a chicken tender basket at Applebee's, which yeah. wasn't the best, but it was a way but, but you were committed. You it you accept there. you accepted the role and you went for it. Well done. But it was the I experience, mean, and now you got a story. So I mean, there's that too. Yeah, exactly. You had fun it doing it. Didn't that's, end up that's, with a, it did not end up with anybody in the ER. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we just started this past year. Well, we're actually no, we're a little over a year. We're we're yeah, fifteen episodes. Yeah, yeah, we're fifteen episodes in. Uh, so once a month, we've started a Star Wars RPG uh, here on our channel. And we do it uh, the second Monday of every month. We start a little bit earlier than we normally would for our live shows. And we go for about two, two and a half hours. And we play uh, Star Wars RPG. Her husband, John, who's a, who's our editor, is also our GM for the game. And and he comes on. And, awesome. And so, yeah, yeah we've got a guy, a couple guys from a couple other uh, podcasts who come on. They're our regulars. And we've had awesome. people come jump in, you know, with like, you know, for one episode as a one off character, just come in, you know, one or two episodes. It's a lot of and, fun. And, and yet, this do... is somehow like we can't get we can't get a game group in our local town started. But this RPG group that we play with online, we have one guy in Colorado, one in New in Virginia and one in Alaska. That's and fantastic. We all show up. That's great. That's great. That's that's awesome about Zoom. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, pandemic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I'm the I'm the rookie. I I had never played any tabletop games and before you know any any RPGs before we started into this. So there's still times where like I'm like I can do that, right? I just have to ask. I'm, I'm yeah. good. I'm I'm still I, I still feel like I'm feeling my way around a little bit. Although the last couple episodes, John said I I uh, was a little more sure of myself. And you're starting to come into your own. It's 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 pretty impressive. I, I used to drive our dungeon master uh, nuts because we. Um, I was a huge fan of Michael Mor Morcock's Eternal Champion series, mm -hmm. um, the Elric of Melnabone. He's a he's a albino prince who brings down and uh, of a race of um, people of humanoids that have evolved from dragons, and they're kind of like chaotic, evil. And so he brings down their entire race, like he destroys them all. And it's okay. this entire series that that ends with this blowing of the horn of fate that brings our time into being, like our like the world as we know it now. So it's everything before. And um, but he's this character that he's this. So he's a, you know he he wants to be good, but it's in this chaotic evil world. But he's an albino, so he has to um he has to carry with him a sword that's really a demon in the sword. At, it, and it makes him go berserk whenever mm -hmm. he whenever he uses it, and he, because he's you know this character, he gets this supreme insane power. So I mean, he destroys gods and he destroys, and he becomes so extremely powerful. So I was obsessed. So I was always like, okay, I want to be an albino. I want to be a Malnabonian. And you know, and he would be like, okay, we're not doing your character is not Elric of Malnabone. And I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> I want it to be. That's right. You're not the boss of me. I do what That's I want. Right. That's right. <laughs> Until he's the GM, and then no, you don't do what he wants. Exactly. That's right. Troops. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, Gordon, one of the things that we we love and that our listeners love as well uh, is hearing about things that happen either when the cameras turn off or the things that happen in between takes, uh, because these are things that weren't necessarily added to their favorite shows. So is there a story that happened uh, in that, ty- that type of behind-the-scenes setting on Andromeda that you would be willing to share with the audience, one that, that you enjoyed? Yeah, I don't know if I enjoyed this story, but I'll tell you it. And I have right. a souvenir. And I have a souvenir too. Here it is. This is a is a handlebar from over top of one of the the um the the doors. You know the doors that would open and close the the um I can't remember what we called them now. I think it was this was between Med Bay and um, <clears throat> Machine Shop, perhaps Med Bay and Machine Shop, perhaps. But anyway, so it's over the door. And as Harper, I liked to move differently. Like in mm-hmm. scenes, I would try. I would try to. I would try to hop over the rail, or I'd try to sit on the console, or I would try to. You know, you're stuck inside. You're stuck inside this this ship you're supposed to imagine. So I, I th- would think you would explore the space a little bit more and have fun with it. And so this thing was was screwed to the wall, and we're we're doing rehearsal. And I thought I'm gonna run in, and I'm gonna run up, and I'm gonna dive, and I'm gonna grab this thing and swing myself through the doorway. And so we've got the entire crew. And so I go running up and I dive through the air and I grab it. And then I wake up in an ambulance. (laughs) (laughs) And it's hours later and it's hours later and I've got a blanket on me. Yeah, and I'm shivering. And I remember the paramedic in the ambulance is like really irritated with me. And I'm like thinking, why is this person irritated with me? And what happened? And so they get, I get to the hospital. My wife shows up. She's all worried. Like they called me at work. I'm like, what the, what, what's, what happened? What happened? Um, I mean, I didn't say what happened, what happened yet. Because apparently what happened was this was like a dummy set thing, right? Like it wasn't bolted to the wall. It was just tacked there. <laughs> so as I grabbed it and swung through the doorway, It released and down I went. I was like full horizontal at head height and I went down and these doors, because they have, these doors are designed to be like a, like a, um, a, uh, a framed opening. So it's not a doorway where it's on the ground. It's Mm -hmm. a door where it's a doorway where it's like a frame all the way around, like a hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. So they have a plywood fake door in between so they can slide it open and close like a hatchway. Right. Which means that the ground, you know, at the bottom, there's a, a good eight inches of, of uh, plywood sticking up and that's when my head hit the back of my head and gave me a concussion and for the next i guess four hours i kept repeating the same three sentences over and over again and that's it i kept saying um what day is it is it my birthday and um something else i can't remember what it was what day is it is it my birthday where's my wife what day is it is it my birthday where's my wife what day is it? Is it my birthday? For hours and hours. Boy. So I guess, yeah, the crew got really wor- worried. They got really scared and really worried, obviously. And that's why the paramedic in the van in the a- ambulance was getting really irritated with me because they were sitting next to a person saying, what day is it? <laughs> is it my birthday? Where's my wife? What day is it? Is it like they were lit- I was with it enough to see that look on their face. And so, it, yeah, yikes. Yeah, so, um, but I survived and I kept this. And, uh, and yay. So now it's my, now it's my lucky hatchway thing. And, um, you know, they're like, you know, they're afterwards, they were like, you know, next time, if you want to swing on a piece of the set, just kind of tell somebody first so they can go double check it and make sure it's bolted to the wall. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have one other story. Yeah. Ooh. Fire away. Yeah. This is with from the Steve Basin guy who played raw day. And okay. uh, this, this, we worked on another show right after Andromeda called The Guard. But because we worked together on Andromeda, and on Andromeda, Steve and I used to watch um, Jackass together. On this okay. next show, on this next show, we decided to try and live Jackass while we were shooting. So, <laughs> so while I was in my dressing room, I heard thunk, and a, a golf ball came into my dressing room, and then thunk. And then another golf ball. It was those little trailer dressing rooms. And so I looked out the door, and there's Steve Basic in the parking lot with a bunch of golf balls, and he's hitting golf balls into my dressing room. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay. In that show, my character was uh, um, in a wheelchair. And so on Steve's close-up, I while he, they were filming him, I rolled up in the wheelchair, and because he couldn't see me, because he's tall and I'm, I'm already short and I was in a wheelchair, he couldn't see that during his close-up. I took a glass of water, and I poured it into his pocket, 
while he was doing his close up. <laughs> yeah, and but his phone nice. was in the pocket. Yeah. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I have one more Steve Basic story. I'll yeah, go for it. One. Yeah. We're, yeah. So Take all the time is, you need. We love okay. these. So on the on an episode that I wrote, uh, the, uh, the abridging the Devil's Divide. Which was uh, directed by was it Peter Deloise or was it I can't I can't remember but anyway um, or was it uh, <clears throat> Jorge Montesi anyway um, the scene is uh, we're working we're being we're being enslaved by the patriarch and we're working away and Steve Basic is all muscly with his shirt off and really hot and sweaty and so I went up to Peter Deloise I think it was directing I said just do me a favor just get him to really drink that water get get him to really drink the water like really really drink it. Peter's like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And, and then keep the camera rolling. Peter says, yeah, okay. And so they, the shot is on Steve and, you know, Kevin Sorbo and Steve had this little discussion about getting away from the patriarch or whatever. I can't remember. Maybe been another episode, but anyway, we were enslaved and he had his shirt off and he was hot and tired. And so they finish their lines. They walk away and Steve takes his drink of water. And Peter goes, oh, take, take another drink, Steve. So he takes another drink. He goes, no, drink more, drink more. You're really hot. You're really tired. He drinks more. He drinks more. Now, now pour it all over you. So he pours it all over himself. He's poured it all over himself. And then I walk in and I go, oh, Rod Day, I see you found my pee bottle. <laughs> 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 and then yeah he was like ha 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 <laughs> yeah. oh, i love it those are great messing yeah. with people is fun yeah yeah we used to mess with each other a lot we used to play little pranks and little jokes the cast we all got along really really well um yeah i i loved working with uh with tear with keith hamilton cobb because mm -hmm. we were so different and he was so serious but um he had uh, he he did have a really good sense of humor. He just kept it hidden. We did once we did another scene where um, he didn't want to say his lines because he didn't like them. And understandably, this is an actor like we say actors making strong choices. He was like, okay. my character would not say this. You can't get in a fight with the writer, but as a writer, I can tell you, you have to write words oftentimes that are not great. You'll you'll. You'll write your script, you'll hand it, and they'll give it back to you and go, yeah, this is great, but the executive producer's niece is going to play this alien, and they don't. That's, these lines aren't going to make her look very strong, so uh, we need to make her look stronger. This one, we can't say this because of that. That character, we can't say this. We got this mythology here. We got all that. So it's like giving them a paper cup. They take it, they poke a bunch of holes in it, and they give it back to you, and they say, now make it hold water. And um, and so, so so and that's you know there's nothing against I, I, I'm a writer too I you just have to do this this is the way TV works it's right. not one it's not one person there's so many people involved and so Keith didn't want to say his lines understandably they, uh, and and I you know he's I'm not saying that I, I'm not saying this line and it's just the two of us in the scene and the director looks at me and I look at Keith and I say I'll say it and he's and the director's like what I go I, I'll say it like this I'll go tear I I, I know what you're gonna say. You're going to say, blah, 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 blah. And to that, I say this. And then Keith goes, yeah, well, I'm not saying my next line. And I said, I'll say that one too. I'm going to say, ha, I know what you're thinking. Now you're going to say this. <laughs> and then the next thing you're going to, and so the whole scene is me going, I know what you're going to say. I know what you're thinking. And now you're going to say, and to that, I say this. But next you're going to say this, and to that, I'll say this. And so he didn't have to say his lines. I said all his lines and did the whole scene. And the whole time he's looking at me, and he's just going like this. <laughs> he's, it worked. He's, yeah it worked it worked for the scene and he's trying not to laugh he came in and he was like i hate the scene i hate the scene he walked out going like just laughing oh. with a smile on his face i was like that's yes fantastic i got yeah i got keith to smile <laughs> oh that's awesome oh. so i was looking through your list of credits because it's part of the research. You got to get to know the person on the other side of your virtual table. That's just how this works. Why, thank you. You must must have taken hours. No. <laughs> it was exhausting. <laughs> We're still tired. No, just... Yes, 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 of course, of course. Thank I was you. actually interested in a 2016 short film titled Parkman, which... Oh, yay! Oh, and directed, and I searched for it for a little while because a 15-minute film can easily fit into my day, but I couldn't find it. Yeah, it, I think it's on you. It's either on YouTube or on TikTok. I can. I'll, I think it's on YouTube on one of my accounts. Oh, uh, yeah, I just might not have looked hard enough. 
Yeah, I may have taken it. You know what? I may have taken it down because for a while I was going to move everything to my website and I need to get it, put it back up again. But yeah, that was a fun little, that's a fun little, uh, it's a fun little uh, story about an actor who was on his way to an audition and sort of an over, <laughs> it's a bit, uh, it was a bit, um, you know, you always put yourself into these things. An actor that likes to improvise mm -hmm. and, and really likes to go, you know, tries too hard with everything, just that that actor, what you're not supposed to do with those strong choices, he does this with everything. And so, he, <laughs> so for this, he's supposed to do this audition for um, a, a non-speaking audition for a parking lot commercial, but he rents a superhero costume and he comes up with this whole character and he comes up with all this stuff and then he hits his head on the way to the audition and gets amnesia and wakes up believing he must be a real superhero. And because he has this knack to improvise, like he just makes up all this crap about who he must be and what's going on with his little kid. And my son played the little kid. So it's a fun, it's a fun little thing. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube. If it's not, I'll make sure it is after this. I'll okay, good. Because I, I am very much interested in it. It oh, sounds great. Like, like, it just sounds like fun. Yeah, it's really low budget, low key, but it's but it's lots of fun. And and and, and uh, Jorge, I think Jorge Montesi, who's one of the directors, came out one day to help out. A lot of a, a lot of my short films had a lot of Andromeda people helping out. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Awesome. That's awesome. That's one of the best things about like developing that that friendship with your your coworkers is the later down the road you can be like, hey, so I'm doing this project. Do you want to help me? Yeah, yeah. We did. I did another short film called Fracture where. Jorge Montesi again he directed a lot of episodes he was the director for one of the episodes of Andromeda he was my lead actor in the uh in the short film and uh and he was directing Andromeda while uh while that while we were shooting him on the weekend so and all of Andromeda the whole crew came out and they let me borrow all the gear and didn't tell the line producer because the line producer was like you know you can't take the gear you can't take the gear out on the weekend to go help Gordon with his film and so they were like oh yeah yes we will we'll just we'll just do it anyway we won't tell them. <laughs> and so I had like so and so I had like the whole crew out I had like water trucks and you know like cranes and lights and all this stuff like all just for free coming out mm -hmm. to help out and I was like oh my gosh like I really have to make make this work out but I rent I rented a Weaver Stedman, which is the rollover thing. The the rollover Weaver Stedman is what will take a camera and turn it completely mm -hmm. 360 mm, okay. upside down. And it's it's a special mount because these film cameras and now digital, but then film are huge cameras. So to be able to do this with a camera that's running film requires a very special mount. And I right. used it. I wanted this shot where he goes to bed. We roll over and he opens his eyes and he's somewhere else. He's, you know, because it's two characters that are fractured, their realities overlapping. Ah, uh, okay. We get to set the next day and um, uh, the, uh, the, first of all, all the, all the, all the equipment is wet because it rained over the weekend while we were shooting. And the line producer wanted to know why the heck is all the equipment wet? <laughs> Because nobody told him that they took it all out to help me with it. So so they had, I think he figured out that, yes, they went and helped Gordon with his short film, obviously. But then I saw that on the shot list, um, Jorge had the same shot to use the Weaver Stedman on Kevin Sorbo. And I think this was, this was an episode, and this was a vault of the heavens, I think. This is, again, an episode that I wrote, that, that I wrote. So, and he's using the same shot. And I'm like, Jorge, you're using my, what? That was my shot from our, he's like, yeah, we rented it. I'm not afraid to steal a shot. Exactly. <laughs> it like, so it was so surreal because on the weekend I was, we were doing this shot where he was the star and he was the director. And then during the week, he was the director of the episode that I wrote using the mount that I rented. The, and it was all just very, very blurry. And it was really, it was funny. <laughs> Tell him next time is not that he's stealing it, that he's repurposing it. Well, then he said to me, Gordon, do you really think this shot has never been done? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Nobody is now. Yeah, every shot is stolen. <laughs> yeah, nobody in the in the course of history has ever done a rollover shot. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Gordon <laughs> did it first. Way to be a thief. That's that's right. I I thought of it first. Absolutely. Uh, All no. right. No. All right, Gordon. We're at the point of our show where we like to wrap things up with okay. a silly question. All now, right. it used to be that we would ask all kinds of variety of silly questions, but we've asked this one a couple times and we love the answers that we're getting on it. So we're, we're kind of we're going to run with this one for a little while just to <clears> see <throat> what the responses are, because basically once you're no longer a kid, nobody asks you this anymore. So, Gordon. Yes. What's your favorite dinosaur? What's my favorite dinosaur? Ooh, I guess a velociraptor because they're kind of cute. Velociraptors are cute, but deadly. Mm -hmm. 
like me. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're the zebras of the dinosaur world. That's right. They're the zebras of the dinosaur world. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I think definitely the Velociraptor. They hunt in packs of three, right? The, don't they? Yeah. And they're the, little, so, yeah. the little guys. They're the, they're the smaller ones. Not, they're yeah. not the giant. I mean, smallish compared to a T Rex. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think yeah. technically right. Velociraptors were actually only the size of turkeys. That's what I thought too. Yeah. And then. Okay. People think that they're bigger because they Jurassic made them Park. bigger for Jurassic Park. Right. When those are actually Dionychus. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, they didn't think that people would be scared of um, uh, turkeys. Yeah. What's the other one that has like that weird, it's got like a weird shell thing that comes up on its head and it's got like orange and red. It almost looks like a mohawk. It's like an, it starts with an app. Uh, you know, I used to know, I used to read the dinosaur books to my boys when they were young. And so, of course, they had to memorize every dinosaur. Like you said, when you're a kid, what's that one called? That was a good one. Um, Mohawkosaurus. Uh, yeah, we're gonna exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go with that. I don't yeah. remember. It's Kathleen will look one. it up and she'll have it. She'll have right, it. By it's end. not one of the ones that my daughter is obsessed with. So I don't remember. Is there an alp? Al no, that's not alp. Alpaca sore, or you're right, there's one like that. Yeah, it's something like that, I think. Yeah, might be. Might be. Yeah. We'll have Kathleen Google it while we're talking. She's That's one of her major skills in life. What? All right. Me? Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Because I'm already over here doing it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gordon, thank Yay. you so much for being on the show with us today. Where can our viewers and our listeners find out more about your work and what you've got going on? Yeah, you can check my, you can follow my TikTok channel. I'm doing videos like every day, almost every day on my TikTok channel, mm -hmm. which is just my name, Gordon Wolvet, and on YouTube. Also, if you're interested in taking improv with me, I teach improv. Improv is my life, like many classes a day, uh, 9 to 16 on outschool.com, actually up to 18. And, uh, so 9 to 18, just go to outschool.com and teacher Gordon. I'm the first Gordon on outschool. And um, uh, for adults, I'm starting some adult classes on GordonWolvet.com. You can pre-sign up for that now. If you're in the Vancouver, British Columbia area, I'm performing at the Tightrope Impro Theater on Thursdays in the Maestro Show. So come by the Tightrope Impro Theater on, th on a Thursday and uh, see some live improv, and you just might catch yours truly. Very cool. So is it the one with the, like, the, the crest that like split? I think so. Is it there's like orange and red on there? Yeah, it's like a the the Yeah, there might be two. The, yeah, what's it called? Like, the Lyosaurus? Maybe. Not, you know, it, you'll get it and right? nothing will register in my brain. We will just have John edit it and put it on the screen because we'll I know that it. John knows what we're talking about. <laughs> All right, guys, I want to remind everybody that subscribing is the single most important thing you can do to help our show continue to grow. Get more amazing guests like Mr. Gordon Wolvet here today and have these funny moments for you guys to be able to listen to. So please subscribe. It helps out well more than we'll ever really be able to tell you. And be sure to check out Gordon's work as well. He's got a lot of cool stuff going on. Go to his websites. Uh, you can take some classes from him. And if you're in the Vancouver area, go check him out. Go do some, watch him do some improv. I think you'll have a good time. Uh, but... Hey, if for whatever reason you're not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. That, of course, is the Bride of Chucky. And I guess by default, Chucky as well. This duo of murder dolls is looking for a reason to cut someone. Chances are we've given you plenty of reasons in this interview alone. So send two copies of your complaints to the murder dolls, one for Chucky and one for his bride. What's that? They don't like being called murder dolls? Well... It was nice knowing you because we're screwed. <laughs> uh, and maybe maybe they'll just go for John, our editor, who's hiding in the background. He's the newest and has the least screen time, so go for him. Place all my mistakes on him. Yeah, I'm good with that. One more thing to show you before I say goodbye. <laughs> oh, look at that. This was, that. this was alternate dimension Harper. This was the, this is the poster when I was uh, an overlord in an alternate dimension. I've still got that, yeah. Some more swag. And um and you said dog and Chucky in a sentence one time I was walking and somebody walking my little dog he was little at the time and a Chucky fan pulled up and said hey aren't you David from and then my dog shot three feet into the air and a stream of diarrhea shot out his butt <laughs> and they said never mind and they drove off <laughs> when you get recognized and your dog has explosive launching in the air diarrhea at the same time.
Yikes. <laughs> yeah. Those are my parting oh, words. Gotta love, I love it. it. You know, we can't end on a better note than that. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> Gordon, thank you again. This has been a lot of fun. And guys, that's going to wrap us up for the FSF podcast. Goodbye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Don't forget to walk your dogs. Yes. <laughs> Copyright 2023 FSF Podcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Podcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at FSFpodcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.